I just have a word I want to share with us this morning. I mean, are we still worshipping Jesus as we're listening to his word? Yeah? And you know that Jesus is here this morning? How many believe that? (laughs) How many know that life can get so busy and so complicated and so, what's the word, distracting, that we lose focus and we shift our attention from what's really important and uh, we make no apologies this morning about focusing all our attention on Jesus. He's the one we love, he's the one we worship, he's the one we glorify, he's the one we exalt, he's the one that has set us apart, not just for ministry, but to enjoy him, amen? So I want to share this morning, and we won't do any announcements, Um, the announcement is this, Jesus is coming back, get ready, that's the announcement this morning, okay? Jesus is on his way back. (laughs) <laughs> so let's be about our father's business until he returns and um, I have a, a beautiful word this morning it's very different it's going to come across very different um, I have a whole, whole bunch of scriptures you know someone says this every time we open God's word God opens his mouth how many want God to speak this morning well he's going to speak through his word <laughs> By his spirit, through his word. Every time we open God's word, God opens his mouth. And there's lots of pressure on me as a preacher to come up with something new every week. And I love my job. I love spending time with the Lord. I love studying his word. I love just listening to his word. His word is like a river that washes my soul. Do you know that? And you can ask my family. Yesterday, we're driving to my son's basketball, and we're just listening to the word. They, They just put on this particular translation of the word it's very upbeat it's got background music and it's just we're listening to the word no preaching just the word listening 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 to the word and I was so much more in love with Jesus just listening to his word my heart was opened I almost had to pull over because I was just overcome with the beauty and majesty of our savior Jesus just listening to his word so I don't have a bag of tricks that I bring my best sermon to you I try and live the word, I try and study the word, and more importantly, I try and preach the word. And the whole thing about preaching the word is that you don't need my ideas and my next best thing and my greatest revelation. What you need is God's word in your heart, amen? (laughs) Because if you have God's word, you've got everything. So not that you guys put pressure on me, I put pressure on myself to have to come up with something new. And there's nothing new under the sun, amen? So we need that the end time church is the church going back to the word Paul says to Timothy give yourself devote yourself to the public reading of scriptures so Paul says to Timothy that's how we grow the church build the church not your next sermon not with all the slides I'm not anti-slides and we're gonna have slides this morning but it's not about that are we listening and are we preaching God's word, because that's the power that's going to transform you. Amen? Are we good? So I'm setting us up. We're going to listen to a lot of word this morning. And the good thing about technology is that if I'm talking too fast this morning, you can go back and listen to it as many times as you want, and you don't have to miss out on anything. Yeah? We good? I'm awake. I'm just testing you're awake, okay? <laughs> Let's go with uh, Philippians 4.1. I'm going to teach out of Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to give us a little Bible survey this morning. And we're going to read a, a chunk of scripture. And that's why I've got some slides there. But let's start. Father, we thank you this morning that you are here by your word and by your spirit. King Jesus, thank you that you are here. You're alive this morning. And you're here walking amongst us to reveal yourself to us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are here glorifying Jesus, revealing Jesus leading us into all truth. Father, we pray that your word will not return to you void this morning, but it will accomplish what you sent it out to do. Father, help us to know you more, to love you more, to obey you more, Lord, because you're worthy of it all this morning. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Okay, Philippians 4, chapter 1, sorry, 
chapter 4, verse 1, starts with this. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Now, my lightning quick mind said, okay, therefore is therefore reason. Okay, so Paul's just written the whole of chapter 3, and he's concluded it, and now the way we number the, the New Testament, it doesn't really flow with thought, it just flows with numbers and chapters and verses. But that should be actually the end of chapter 3, not the beginning of chapter 4, for me, in my mind, because it follows the thought of chapter 3. Are we following? So Paul's saying, because of what I've just written, this is how you're going to stand firm in the Lord. How many of you want to stand firm in the Lord? If there's ever a time for the church to stand firm, it's now, isn't it? It's now or never. Who sang that song? Elvis, wasn't it? Come on, it's now or never for the church. And contrary to what society teaches us and media and all the progressive thinkers out there, the Word of God is still the Word of God. <laughs> the Word of God still works. It's our only sure foundation. Nothing else compares to the Word of God. Hebrews says it's alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. The psalmist says it's a light unto our feet. How many you need some light in your darkness this morning? It's going to come through the word. How many you got to make some decisions you don't know what to make? It's going to come through the word this morning. Amen? The word is living and active and it's going to speak to your heart this morning. And I love the language here of Paul. He uses intimate, affectionate, strong, assertive, yet gentle language. He's saying, look... I want you guys to be strong. I want you guys to stand firm. I want you guys to not look back on your life with regret and disappointment, but look forward to there's an event happening, there's something's going to take place that you're, you and I are part of that I want you to be part of in the end, and you need to stand firm in order to get there. Amen? And Paul writes this beautiful truth in Philippians chapter 3, and I, and I pray this morning it's going to speak to us. Amen. So New Testament survey of the book of Philippians very quickly, just so we know, because I don't like pre preaching scripture out of context. Uh, Philippians 3 is in the book of Philippians, and the whole theme of the book of Philippians, Paul's writing to this church that he started uh, in chains, is in Rome, and he's looking back and writing to strengthen them. And the whole theme about the book of Philippians is joy. Joy, it's the book of joy. He's, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord many times. And even for what he was going through, he was just pointing them back to the Lord. So the chapter one of the book Philippians is the message of our lives, which is the gospel of Jesus. Can I ask you this morning, is the gospel of Jesus still the message of your life? Or have you added other messages to the most important message of your life? Chapter two talks about uh, the model for our lives. What do we model our lives after? And the model of our lives is the example of Jesus Christ. If you, if you read Philippians two, you see... Jesus was exalted, he humbled himself, but God exalted him. The, he's the model of our life. And chapter 3 is the motive for our life, is, is the why we do what we do. And Paul beautifully points to the motive of our life has to be Jesus, the reward of Jesus. Not ministry, not success, not titles, not bigger churches, not more money, not more blessing, not answered prayer. Paul's saying, let's strip it all back. And come back to the one motive that's going to last to the ages is the reward of Jesus Christ. And like I say this morning, if anything you do for the Lord is not for the reward of knowing the Lord more, then it's built on a wrong foundation. Because Paul beautifully shows us to strip everything back and to bring us back to Jesus is my reward. Nothing else. Not a bigger house, not children, not husbands and wives, not breakthrough. And I'm not anti those things, those things that we needed. I, I love the fact that I'm married and have five beautiful children. But that's not my reward. That's not my inheritance. People make their family and their jobs and their careers and their money and their titles their inheritance, but it's not. And Paul beautifully shows us, which we're going to unpack this morning, that everything's got to be wiped away not that they're not important, but compared to Jesus, they don't measure up. 
And then chapter 4, he finishes beautifully with the means for our life. In other words, the supply of our life is the provision of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to read a, read a whole bunch of scripture this morning, starting with Philippians chapter 3. Uh, so I encourage you to read. You can read it out loud if you want. You can read in your mind. You can read in your own translation. I'm just going to read what's there. And as I read God's word, God's going to speak this morning. Can you say amen? It says here, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me. It's important in mind reminding the church, not coming up with new stuff all the time. And it's a safeguard for you. Say safeguard for you. So this chapter is written to protect you. It's your safeguard. If we're not building our lives on this foundation, somewhere, somehow, our lives are going to become unstuck. Why? Because everything that's not built on the motive of Jesus is my reward is going to be shaken. <laughs> so this is our safeguard. Now, I don't expect to get many amens, but one every now and then will be very helpful for me, okay? <laughs> and he goes on here, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And Paul's playing on words here. Because we know who he's referring to. He's referring to the religious order, the, the Jewish of the time, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the couldn't sees and would and wannabes. They're all over here. And they were saying stuff like, yes, Jesus is great, but you need to be circumcised. You need to go to the temple and offer the offerings. And Paul's saying, no, watch out for those dogs. And it's a play on words because the Jewish people used to call Gentile dogs. They were the dogs, the scraps left over from the Jews is for the Gentiles. And Paul's saying, no, 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 you guys are the dogs because you don't trust in Jesus. It was very, very, very tricky, Paul. It was very cheeky. It was very cheeky. That's why he got himself in a lot of trouble and got kicked and stoned and they had to lead him down the basket because he just pressed where he felt Jesus was pushing so people can see Jesus. Amen. And it says here, for we are the circumcision. <laughs> now he's really rubbing it in. He said, no, no, these guys have a physical sign of circumcision. But that was all pointing to, we are the circumcision. Now we have our hearts that have been, the sinful nature has been cut off. We're born again. We're brand new creatures. We are the circumcision. I want to start a movement and say, we are the circumcision. You think that'll go good? It won't go that good. But anyway, Paul's saying, that's the, come on, we're, we're God's people now. We're the circumcision. Don't let everyone disqualify you. And there's somehow in the, in the religious order, and I hang around pastors sometimes, and it's my job to hang around with pastors, and sometimes, not, not on purpose, but some people, well, you're not like us, and you don't worship like us, and we have all this stuff, and we've got all this tradition, and we've got all this, and they want to disqualify you from entering to God's presence. Paul's saying, no, don't let them disqualify you. You are Christ chosen. You have been circumcised if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. He says here, who worship by the Spirit of God. Some translations say in the Spirit of God. Either way is good. It's either by or in, through. It's all through the Spirit of God. And glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Put that no confidence in our own merit. Put no confidence in our religious activity. Put no confidence in me earning the blessing of God. Now, if you've been a Christian for longer than 10 minutes, the enemy is going to try and lie to you that you think you, you have to earn your way to God. That we have provisional Christians, we have learner Christians, provisional Christians, and then the mature Christians. And until you get to that maturity level, whatever that is, God's not really interested in you. And you won't really aspire to blessing and you won't get access to God. And Paul's just counterculture that. He's smacking it in the face. Saying, no, we put no confidence in the flesh. He says, I, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, also, if anyone thinks, sorry, anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And Paul begins to boast now. And he says, look, if you guys think you can qualify, then I'm more than you. That's what he's saying. So if you, you think you can earn your way to God's favor and blessing and righteousness and access to him, 
Now, let me show you. I qualify more than you. <laughs> and he says, he's circumcised on the eighth day, according to the law. Eighth day, every male Hebrew child had to be circumcised. The sign of the covenant God made to Moses through the generations. Of the people of Israel. So just making sure that my pedigree, my heritage, I want to prove to you guys, I could have qualified, but I don't. Of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul was the dude. <laughs> he obeyed everything he knew to obey. But check this out. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed. So not only he's saying those things that I counted valuable, I thought those things were valuable. I count them as loss. Indeed, I count everything as loss. <laughs> because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Now, rubbish is a nice word. In the Greek, in the original, it doesn't say rubbish. It says dung, excrement. You get the point. Rubbish is a nicer way to say it. We say, I count those things as dog poop. That's what he's saying. In order, in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Let's keep reading. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Yeah, I love that language there. Next slide. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do. And today we're going to talk about one thing that we need to do. Just one thing. Are you glad Jesus, following Jesus is simple? It's not a million things you've got to do. We complicate it. I've got to get up and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. To... No, no. One thing we need to do. And Paul shows us what it is. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on. One thing I do. I press on, I strain forward, forgetting. <laughs> and he, again, he's being cheeky. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if you think anything different or otherwise, God will reveal this to you. <laughs> In other words, one day you're going to get it. You're going to see it like I do. And if you don't, that's okay. God's going to show you the way I think one day. <laughs> but that's okay. We're cool, all right? Let's agree to disagree. That's what he's saying. <laughs> anyway, I'm just laughing at myself this morning. <laughs> Uh, only let us hold true to what we have attained. Very important. Paul's saying, let's not slip back. Let's not go backwards. Let's not fall less and less in love with Jesus. Let's not get so caught up with life and ministry and that we know Jesus less now than we did before. No, he says, let us live up to what we've already attained. And notice how the safeguard for the church, brothers, join in imitating me. <laughs> now he's saying, I want you to become like me. That's very scary, yeah? But it's the truth. He says, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Leadership is all about example. Not titles, not recognition, not ministry. Leadership's not about ministry. It's about living as an example before God 
and before his people that his people have someone to follow. That's why I'm not Pastor Jim. <laughs> I won't get offended if you call me Pastor Jim, but it's not who I am. I'm Jim, and my function in the body of Christ is a pastor. But I'm not better than you. I don't have a high title before God, before you, or else we're disqualifying ourselves from the, in the gospel. Now, I'm Jim, who's a pa- Phil, who's a pastor, not Pastor Phil. Why is that important? Because we're recognizing actually leadership is not a title, it's a function. It's not a title. And there's no clergy laity in the Bible. I dare you to find it. It doesn't exist. There's no full-time lovers of Jesus and part-time lovers of Jesus in the Bible. It doesn't exist. It doesn't matter what you're called to do. We're all called to love, follow, obey Jesus with all our heart. Can you say amen? we just got different functions. That's all. It's like my body. My body's got different functions. Where do we get up to? Yeah. For many, check out Paul's heart and his apostolic heart. Remember, this is for your safeguard. This is how we stand firm. (laughs) For many of whom I've often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And he's talking about people in the church. He's not talking about unsafe people. We know unsafe people don't want anything to do with Jesus. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. To to them, it's foolishness. He's talking about people in the church. He's warning about people in the church who want nothing to do with the cross of Jesus. He says, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly or their appetite. And they glory in their shame. In other words, they boast in what they do wrong. With minds set on earthly things. It's a bit of a heavy word, but I love it. (laughs) He says, yeah, but, but. Everyone say, but. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. We sang about this morning. By the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. Then we get Philippians 4, chapter 1. Therefore, my dear brothers, this is how you stand firm in the Lord. That's after that last verse. So there's a lot in there, and I don't expect us to grab it, and, but we're going to pick a few things here and there, and I want to just encourage us to be about the Word of God. My fear, and I think a danger in the modern church, is that we make converts, but not many disciples. And then we make disciples who want to do the stuff, but are not in love with Jesus. And to be honest, I love doing the stuff. (laughs) I love getting my hands dirty and getting active and doing stuff for the Lord. (laughs) I'm more identified with Martha than with Mary, yeah? How many Marthas do we have? Any Marthas? Come on, be honest. Not many Marthas, okay. <laughs> We've got Marthas, yeah? We want to do the stuff. <laughs> but then we can encourage us, not at the expense of our number one privilege and blessing, which are, is our relationship with Jesus. Can you say amen? That's what I love about Phil. I mean, I love lots of things about Phil, but he's got a heart after Jesus. And in his relation with God, he, he reminds us to keep our relation with God the main thing. You hearing pray, that's what his heart is. The number one thing in your life is not what you do, is what you have, is your relationship with Jesus. And if we don't invest in our relationship with Jesus, you know, I dare suggest this morning, everything else we're giving our time to, Paul says is rubbish dung excrement and we play in the excrement and we say God look at what we're doing for you he's saying wait let me turn off God look at what I've done for you this week
And the Martha's in our midst are saying, well, the job's got to get done. And I agree. There is a job that we've got to be about. I agree. We're not just sipping pina coladas somewhere waiting for Jesus to return. That was for my wife. <laughs> First, Jesus. Not do you occasionally talk to him during the day. Not do you, you know, do something. Are you in love with Jesus? Come on. Do you long to be with Jesus? Not read your Bible. I'm not anti reading the Bible. I love, I told you I read the Bible every day. But not just so I can get knowledge and information. So I want to find Jesus. I want to know Jesus. And so are you as passionate for Jesus today as when you first believed? That's the test. Jesus said to the Ephesian church, which Paul planted, which was a thriving church, which was doing a whole bunch of stuff. They say 20,000 people, probably members of that church. It rocked the whole Asian minor region. From there, the whole Asia Minor heard the word of God. But Jesus, 50 years later, looks back and, and, and looks down at Ephesus and says, I love what you're doing. You're doing great. Well done. But, but, you've forsaken your first love. You forgot what it's all about. And Jesus doesn't want us to build things and do stuff and, and we lose him. Tragedy. So though it's a heavy word, it's a safe word for you. Come on, you want your marriage to last? You want your kids to love Jesus? You want to last till Jesus returns? We heard about that. You want to be strong? You want to stand firm? This is where it starts. Not fancy sermons. Not, it's Jesus, do I love you today? Am I enthralled by your beauty today? Do I long to be with you today? Amen. And we're going to read some stuff. How are we going with time? Not too bad. Okay. One thing is needed. To know Jesus. To love, to obey him. It's our first calling. We said um, some of the things we've had to adjust. And for me in my heart is that we're focused on the work of the Lord. But are we f focusing on the Lord of the work? <laughs> That's very important. And we want to do the work, yeah? But we want to focus on the Lord of the work more than the work of the Lord. Amen? Jesus said he will build this church. And it's our job to make disciples. It's not our job to build the church. It's not me and Philly's job, our leadership team, deacon team to build the church. That's not our responsibility. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against that church that I'm building. Now go and make disciples. Now what's a disciple? A disciple is a follower of Jesus. So we're called to make disciples who love Jesus. That's our call. So Sunday isn't it just about the lost and all the evangelists in the room will say, oh no, I'm not going to bring my friends anymore. Now keep bringing your friends. <laughs> but it's not just about reaching the lost. We, we miss it. Yes, we want to reach the lost in our meetings. Yes, we want to preach the gospel in our meetings. But also we want to disciple God's people in our meetings. We want you to walk away from here not thinking what I have to do to, to, to serve God. How do I love Jesus better? How is Jesus revealed in our meetings? How can I implement that in my life? Does that make sense? We good? Okay. We're going to look very quickly now at Martha and Mary because I referred to them earlier. And I'm going to read some scripture in Martha and Mary, and three quick points, and we're done. So John 11, verse 1 to 2. Um, just give us a bit of background here, in case you didn't know. Let's read here. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord... And wiped his feet with her hair. So just in case you're wondering who this Mary is that we're going to read about, it's the sister of Lazarus and the sister of Martha. And it gives just a little background 
and gives us a little snapshot into what happened here. So let's go down to Luke chapter 7 and we pick up the story where Luke doesn't identify who this lady is, but Matthew and John and Mark identify her. Now, I don't know, Luke was a doctor. He was trying to be a bit diplomatic, I think, <laughs> whereas the other guys was not. Nah, that was Mary, but Luke was trying to protect her identity, maybe, I don't know. But he didn't say specifically who it was, but we know, because John just told us, this Mary is Lazarus' sister. And it's very important for us to understand that. It says, now one of the Pharisees was requesting to eat with him, with Jesus, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. And she bought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and she wiped them with the hair of her head and began kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. That's a very strange situation. It doesn't give us insight into where... Mary encountered Jesus before this. It doesn't tell us. But I'm so sure she would have seen Jesus do some stuff. She might have been in the crowd where Jesus talked to the woman who was caught in adultery. And they brought her before him. And they said to Jesus, what does the law say? And he beautifully restores that lady. and says, neither do I condemn you. Go in peace. I'm sure she would have heard, she would have seen, she would have had some type of encounter with Jesus before this very event. Or is this event doesn't make any sense. But she saw Jesus, she recognized him. More than the Pharisees did. <laughs> and notice what they say. Now the Pharisees who invited him saw this. He said to himself, if this, if this man were a prophet, can I put my religious voice on? He would know who and what sort of person this woman was who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Funny how religious people always want to point out your faults. <laughs> you don't qualify. <laughs> You're not good enough. You're not holy enough. You don't read your Bible enough. Always pointing fingers. Someone said... Someone points a finger, there's three pointing back at you. See that? So don't point fingers because there's three coming back at you. And Jesus responded to him and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. He replied, and he said, say, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they were unable to repay, 500 denarii, a denarii is worth a day's wage, so 500 days wages is probably two years worth of wages. It's quite a lot, whatever that is for you. And then, so two years, the other one owed two months. Two years, two months worth of wages. When they're unable to repay, he canceled their debts of them both. So which of them would love him more? And Simon answered and said, I assume the one whom he canceled the greater debt. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. And turning to the woman... He said to Simon, <laughs> do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she has stopped, not stopped kissing my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, say for this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But one, the one who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And then those who were reclining at the table with him began saying to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I love, I love God's word. I love Jesus, how he reveals the Father's love to us. And notice this woman didn't come for salvation. She didn't come to get her sins forgiven. She didn't come with faith. 
She didn't come with a checkbook, a checklist, I should say, of Jesus, I want you to do this, 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 this. She saw Jesus. She worshipped Jesus. And Jesus did everything else. She saw Jesus. She worshipped Jesus. And Jesus took care of her. Can I say it's a beautiful picture of us in the church. We get so caught up in God, I want you to do this and this and breakthrough, this and this and this. I love it. Yes, we're going to keep praying. We're not a prayerless church. We're going to keep praying because it's our destiny and call to pray. But not at the expense of seeing Jesus, worshiping Jesus, and responding to him. Can you say amen? Now, the problem here is, because we read that and we think, well, she was a bad sinner and Jesus forgave her a lot of her sins, but I'm not as bad as that lady, so I don't have a lot of sins like she did, uh, so therefore I don't love God as much as she did, because, and we get confused. Now, our problem is this, we don't know the extent of how bad our sin was and is, and we judge our sin on, on a gradient, it's like a bell curve, so we got not that bad sins, and then bad sin, uh, you know, average sins, and then good sins. And we compare ourselves with other people. <laughs> no, before God, we're all sinners. Why? Because it's not actually what you do, it's where your heart's at. Simon's problem was, he didn't recognize the need for him to need forgiveness. He didn't recognize the need for him to see Jesus and worship him. Because what he was comparing himself to a religious standard, the Pharisees and Sadducees. Like Paul said in Philippians 3, blameless. And we hide behind our activity that we do for God at the expense of seeing him, knowing him, and responding to him. Amen. Anyway, I don't want to get stuck here, but the point is very simple. She has an encounter with Jesus, and faith is a byproduct of her encounter with Jesus. Sometimes we focus too much on faith. <laughs> Now, when we see Jesus, when we love Jesus, when we worship Jesus, faith is the byproduct. Yeah? Faith is not conscious of itself. If you think you need more faith, it's the wrong question to ask. Because <laughs> faith just moves. Faith just responds to Jesus. Never ask itself, do I have enough of you? Do I have enough faith to do this? No. When we see Jesus, we glorify him, we worship him, we respond in what he's telling us. Faith never enters the realm. It's born, Paul says, out of love. Faith expresses itself out of love. Let's keep reading and we're going to finish with some quick points. Are we following? Is that helpful? Thank you. Luke 10. Thanks, Philly. Luke 10. Now, check this out. This is to those who have been Christians for a long time, who buy into the idea that we don't need any more of Jesus. Check this out. Luke 10, now there's three chapters after what we just read. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Now we know who Martha is, yeah? Who's Martha's brother? Who's Martha's sister? Mary. Which Mary was it? The one that pulled the perfume out, yeah? So we're following tracking. She had a sister called Mary who was also seated at the Lord's feet and was listening to his word. Now check this out. Three chapters later, she was at the Lord's feet, worshipping, pouring out perfume. Three chapters later, she's doing the same thing. Maybe not perfume, but she's still sitting at the Lord's feet. See, we never graduate from our intimate personal relationship with Jesus. You never get to a point where you don't need more of Jesus. Never. I want to remind you today. No matter how much of Jesus you know, how much of him you've, is love you're encou you've encountered, there's so much more for you. So much more. That's why Paul wrote Philippians chapter 3. And I love, I love Mary, uh, sorry, Martha. <laughs> because I can hear her tone, my tone in her, what she said. Because I can see myself saying these things. He says, but... Martha was distracted with all her preparations and she came up to him and said, Lord, 
Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving by myself? And she accused the Lord of not caring. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. It's so not only she judges Jesus' motive. You don't care enough for me, Jesus. And then she tells Jesus what to do. She said, then tell her to help me. <laughs> and it, it borders on a bit of arrogance. Come on. And sometimes we're like that. God, don't you care that I'm Come on, Lord, do this and do this. And be careful. Be careful. Remember, he's your Lord. He's your Lord. He's your king. You don't tell him what to do. He tells you what to do. And it's always going to be better for you. Anyway, but the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, can you just hear that beautiful tone? <laughs> Not condemnation, just, Martha, Martha, there's, there's a better way for you, Martha. You're worried and distracted by many things. Jesus has got a way of identifying the, the real cause of your distraction. So Martha, it's not just that Mary doesn't help you and you've got a lot of things to do. Your heart is just so at turmoil that you're distracted and worry about many things so even if I tell Mary to help you tomorrow you're going to be distracted about something else that's what he's saying to her Martha even if I answer your prayers Christian are you listening today if I answer your prayers tomorrow if you haven't learned your lesson you're going to be asking me for the same thing the issue is not me answering your prayers where's your heart at You're worried and distracted about many things. Check this out. But only one thing is needed. Turn to the person next to you say, one thing is needed. You remember one thing out of today's sermon is go back to the feet of your king. Make every decision about how does this affect me being in the presence of Jesus. Don't add Jesus as an optional extra to your life. Once you've done all your day's work, then you tag on Jesus. If that's where you're at, it's no condemnation. But there's more for you. <laughs> Jesus loves you so much that he wants to pour his love out on you. So you can know him and enjoy him and experience him. Not as a tag on. That's the main event of your life. <laughs> Come on. And we look at, we're going to look at that in a second. And he says here, Mary has chosen the good part. So he commends Mary, which shall not be taken away from her. Amen? Now notice what Jesus didn't say to Mary, because this is what we buy into the lie of the church. Okay, now you're saved. Now you've come into the kingdom. Now you've got to start working. Don't worry about your relationship with God. You're in the kingdom now. Just start working. Start serving. Who wants to serve? Come on, everyone, let's start serving. That's what we think the Lord's doing with us. But it's a business model, and it's anti-family, and it's anti-the kingdom. God doesn't need us. And yes, we need people to serve. But if, if serving is Jesus, is your identity, and where you find your worth, can I, with all due respect, say stop serving? Now, you'll never, ever hear a pastor say, stop serving. <laughs> Come on, it's either the truth or it's not. Why? Because the main thing about you is not what you do for God, the money you give to God, because God doesn't need your money and doesn't need your service. It's not what you do for the church. It's not what you do for me. If you're doing anything for me or for Phil or for the church, please stop. Those things, we've read them. Rubbish. The one thing, are you at the feet of Jesus? <laughs> are you found there? Is that your, 
life's main goal. At the feet of Jesus, listening, soaking. Yeah, people come to us and they ask us, what's the Lord saying? And you know what? with all due respect, say to them, I don't know and I don't care. No, I don't want to say that to them because I do. I do care, okay? I do care. <laughs> I do care, I'm being cheeky. But I want to say to them, have you spent time at the feet of Jesus? Before you go to a pastor, before you ask someone, what is Jesus saying to you? Because he's not dumb, he's not deaf, he loves you, he cares for you more than any pastor will care for you. Are we good? We never graduate from needing Jesus, never. I don't care how mature you think you are. Paul says the one thing I need to do, not plant churches, not raise the dead, not write the New Testament. (laughs) One thing I need to do. Our greatest call. This is your greatest call. Can I remind us? It's not what you do. And I love what I do but I won't always be called to be a pastor. So what happens that day? If I've made my whole identity about being a pastor, when I'm not a pastor, what happens? I'm dead. No, my greatest call is not that I'm a pastor, it's that I'm a son. You're a son or a daughter, that's your greatest privilege and call. That's what we need to be focusing on. That's what we need to be spending our time at the feet of Jesus for. Okay, three quick points and we're done. How do we keep the main one, the main thing? The one thing we need to do. One thing we need to do. It's one action, but it's got three different um, movements. Yeah, one action is one thing I need to do, but in that one thing, there's three movements. Number one is, Paul says in Philippians 3, 7, whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. I want you to notice the word counted. But whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that may gain Christ. So point number one is we need to come to the point where everything we've done, everything we've been involved in, everything you've achieved, all your mistakes, all your failures, you need to count them as a loss compared to knowing Jesus. Now, I can't do that for you, but Paul has been a ruthless accountant. How many accountants do we have in the building? Not many. We need to pray for them. Oh, there's one at the back there. Who was that? Isaac. There we go. Isaac's an accountant. There we go. (laughs) <laughs> but Paul's saying, look, in the ledger of my life, can I use accounting terms? In the ledger of my life, what I thought were assets, I count them, I reconcile, that's the word he's using, I reconcile them, I take them out of the assets column, and now I consider them as liabilities. They're no longer assets for me. I count them as a loss compared to knowing Jesus. And he says it three times in two verses. What do you consider your spiritual assets, your religious assets, your financial assets, your academic assets? Come on. What do you consider as assets? Can I boldly remind us today? That compared to you knowing Jesus, they're worth nothing. Not, they're not important. It's a comparison term. Compared to knowing Jesus, they're not as valuable as him in your life. Now, you need to come to that stage in your heart. I can't do it for you. But we value, I mean, we What's the word? We honor in our lives what we consider to be valuable. So if you're still holding on to external things as valuable, 
then they're always going to be fighting against preeminence in your life with Jesus. If you think career, title, property, money in the bank, those things are more important or just as important as Jesus, then they're going to be fighting against each other. The number one way we keep Jesus the main thing is we need to count. We need to be ruthless accountants over your life. You need to look at your life, not with condemnation, not with um, regret, but with grace and love and mercy in your heart and say, Jesus, all these things I've achieved, I shift them over. I count them as a loss. I transact them into a liability column. Amen. And it's, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. We were coming on the M2 this morning. And there was a couple of dead foxes on the, on the, on the road, so a bit of roadkill. And the thing about why foxes are prone to roadkill is because they're sneaky. Have you ever seen a fox? You don't see them that often because they're very sneaky. They come in, they come unnoticed, but they come to the vine and they eat all the fruit without even noticing. And some of these things, they're not bold, loud things that we are very clear or evident. Sometimes they're sneaky little things. They come in. And they come in unnoticed, but let me encourage you today, you need to count them as a loss. Dear brother and dear sister, this is how you're going to stand firm in the Lord. Is your worth in your career, in your relationships, in how well you do? Let's flip it the other way. Do you, do you struggle to find worth because of the mistakes you've made? Paul says, I count all things a loss, good and the bad. They're all in the liabilities column because compared to knowing Jesus, it doesn't matter. We good? <laughs> so your achievements, celebrate them, but compared to Jesus, they're nothing. And your mistakes and misadventures and disappointments, learn from them, but compared to Jesus, they're nothing. Amen? Point number two, we're almost done, is to be found in him. So point number one, Paul says, I count everything as a loss compared to knowing Jesus, three times in two verses. Next he says, and be found in him, not having a righteousness that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and to share in his sufferings, becoming likened in his death, so by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. What is Paul saying there? He's saying, because I've counted everything as a loss, my only hope for right standing before God is his righteousness for me, not my righteousness for him. I can never earn my way into favor with God. And Christian, if you've been a Christian for longer than six minutes, you'll again hear the lie that you have to earn your way into the blessing of God to have favor with God. You have to pray more, you have to read more, you have to fast more, those kind of things. And Paul's saying, no, I want to be found in him, not in my own righteousness, but in his righteousness for me. I want to know him. See, the basis for us to know him is not our performance, is Jesus' performance for us. So once we've counted everything a loss, now God wants us to be found in him. Jesus wants us to go to him, to know the power of his resurrection daily and to share in his sufferings. And some people have a, a trouble understanding sufferings because we think, you know, the American prosperity gospel is that as a Christian you don't have to suffer. Well, that's anti the New Testament. <laughs> Paul says to the churches, I warned you many times that to enter the kingdom of God, we have to suffer many times. And he warns the churches. Now, it's not suffering as we're martyrs. We're suffering because sometimes following Jesus costs us stuff. That's the suffer. It's persecution, misunderstanding, our freedoms. That's what it costs us. So we share that with Jesus because we're found in him. Amen. Someone once said it this way, we die once to sin. So to become a Christian, the Bible says you need to die to your sin. It's repentance and believe in what Jesus did. That's faith. Repent, believe. Repent. So you die once to all your sin, but you die to self daily. Now that's not a very popular message. We die once to all our sin. <laughs> Repent. How many know self wants to come back on the throne? And if you're a Christian, Jesus is on the throne of your heart. 
But self is like a sneaky little fox that wants to come and put itself back on the throne. So we need to die to self daily. <laughs> Again, not very popular, but very needed. Why? Because we need to stand firm for the Lord's return. We never teach the church how to die to self. We wonder why there's so many problems in the church. Because the church thinks everything's about it, about me. It's about my comfort. It's about my convenience. Make me feel good, pastor. Give me a message to tickle my ears, pastor. And we wonder why the church isn't growing up. Because we haven't taught the church, actually, you need to die to self. Your reputation. What do we die to? Reputation. Number one thing. You want to appear more holy. You want to appear more righteous. You want to be more powerful than what you are. Reputation. What about things of the world? I'm surprised how many things of the world creep into the church. And we don't get taught how to die to the things of the world. <laughs> the stuff Christians shouldn't be involved in, full stop. Under grace, in the New Testament. Paul says avoid stuff like that. Just avoid it. But we don't teach about it. And Christians dabble in worldly things. And movies and experiences and drugs and alcohol and sleeping around and divorce and all these kind of things that we get involved in. I wonder why the church is a mess. <laughs> Die to self daily. Ask yourself this question. Is what I'm thinking, doing, saying, giving glory to Jesus? In their 90s, we used to have a bracelet, what would Jesus do? You remember that? WWJD? It's not what would Jesus do, it's, it's what is Jesus doing now. <laughs> Let's have a bracelet, WW, no, WW. Anyway, let's move on because I'm going to distract myself. Paul says it this way, my life means nothing to me. That's what Paul says. This great apostle shook the known world upside down. Now, notice he didn't say my life means nothing because it's, in God, your life is valuable. You're precious to God. It's not your life means nothing, but your life means nothing to me. In other words, it's not about me. And can I speak into your heart? It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about him. <laughs> How are we going to have marriages that glorify Jesus? Well, we make it about him, not about my rights as a husband. How are we going to have kids that glorify Jesus? We are families. It's, it's about him. Not about our kids' convenience. People have kids and they never bring them to church because they never want to wake them up in the morning and they don't want to bring them out in the cold. And I get it. I get it. I get it. But are you pampered to your kids' needs and never put Jesus first? Then those kids grow up thinking, I'm more valuable than Jesus. We brought our kids to everything, man. Everything. Prayer meetings. You name it. We didn't abuse them. Obviously, there's wisdom. <laughs> I'm not, don't hear what I'm not saying, yeah? You make a decision as a couple. You do what you, before God, yeah? But you honor Jesus first. <laughs> I used to carry him out of the car. I used to hate doing that. <laughs> And some, I used to fake being asleep so I could carry them into, the, into their room. And I put them down and they're awake. Wow, that's a miracle. How'd you wake up just now? <laughs> and that was back in the day. We used to do two meetings. We used to do morning and evening. We used to get home wrecked. 10 o'clock night, 9 o'clock wrecked. But our kids grew up knowing Jesus is first. Not church, not marriage. Not their comfort or convenience. Jesus is first. Amen? I don't know how I got started into that. But anyway. <laughs> Last one and we're done. So we've counted things as loss. 
We want to be found in him, not in our own righteousness. We want to press on. And the last point here is pressing on. Notice the humility of Paul here. Now, he could have said, guys, I'm there. I've arrived. When you get to my level, come see me. I'll have this little mansion built here on the hillside overlooking the beautiful vista of the uh, Mediterranean. And I've arrived. I've perfected my ministry. Everything's all good. I'm sipping those pina coladas. So when you're ready, come and have one with me. I'm there, guys. Come and... No. Humility. Not that I've already obtained this. Or I'm already perfect. Can I encourage us? None of us will ever get to perfection, so stop trying to convince anyone you're perfect. We're all a work in progress. We're all still growing. We all still need maturing. We all still need humility to learn from the master because we are his disciples. But how are we going to get there? Well, we count. We found in him. And now he says, I press on. Say press on. In other words, don't rest on your laurels. Don't rest on what you knew of Jesus yesterday, last week, last month, last year, or 10 years ago, I was on fire for Jesus. Well, that's great. What about today? Paul says, press on today. <laughs> Don't rest on your laurels. Are you, do you love Jesus today? I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Don't you love that language? In other words, because I'm in union with Christ, he purchased me, not for what I can do for him, but so I can be with him. He's made me his own. He's called me to himself. And he's calling me upward so I can enjoy this beautiful heavenly calling with him. Not to do ministry not to plant churches. Yes, that will happen, but not at this expense. I press on for Jesus. I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do. And he said one thing to Mary. Paul must have heard the story, I reckon. And he said, man, I want to be like Mary. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Can I encourage us today, wherever you come from, you might be you might think you don't qualify for Jesus. Can I remind you, none of us qualify for Jesus. Let's forget our past. Forgetting what lies behind. And straining forward. That word there is from, Paul takes it from chariot racing. Chariot racing was the bomb back then. It was like our NRL, everyone was watching it. We had the saints and the Tigers, and the Saints always won. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rocker. Sorry, Rocker. I'm joking around. And the image is this. The, the chariot riders are on a little platform. And as the race is nearing the end, they would strain forward. They would press on. They will press in to the, the horse so they could be one with the horse so they can complete the race quicker. That's what Paul's saying here. Forgetting what's behind Straining forward, pressing in, staying close to our maker, staying very, very, very huddled, huddled to him. Why? Because the day's coming, the race is going to be finished. So let's press on together. Amen? That's what he's saying. I press, straining forward what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Amen? It's talking about there staying in the course, pursuing Jesus with all your might, all your strength. He is your reward. He is your prize. He is your inheritance. Not you're going to get something somewhere. It's him. He's the one our soul longs for. He's the one we need. Can I ask the musicians to come up, please? I'm going to ask us to stand. And um, we're just going to sing to Jesus. We're going to worship him. We're going to respond to him. I want to just pray for us. If you need to make adjustments this morning, if you need to settle some things in your heart, I trust that as I've been speaking God's word, the Holy Spirit's been just talking to you, some adjustments, little things we need to fix, maybe big things.
I want to pray for us this morning. Father, help us keep the main one, the main thing this morning, Lord. Father, help us to make the adjustments necessary by the power of your Holy Spirit to keep pursuing Jesus as our one thing, Lord. We desire to stand firm for you in this dark and decaying world, Lord. We want to shine bright like stars, Lord. Father, thank you for giving us your son, Jesus, to not only save us and redeem us, but so that we can know him, we can love him, we can have fellowship with him, we can enjoy him, worship him and adore him. Father, I ask you to stir every heart this morning. Those in the room, those watching later or now on YouTube, stir our hearts for more of you this morning, Jesus. We have settled in our relationship with you. Show us there's so much more in you, Lord God. We have elevated what we do and our achievements above Christ. Lord, help us count them as a loss this morning, Lord. We want to be found in you, Jesus. And Father, today, by your Spirit, help us to press on by forgetting what's behind and looking forward to the glory and the joy that is set before us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that our citizenship is in heaven this morning. And from there, we eagerly await our Savior. King Jesus, we worship you. We adore you. We love you this morning. Come have your way for us this this morning, Lord.